Welcome everybody to our hour long myofunctional therapy q and I'm super excited to be here. I'm going to be your host for tonight. My name is Brittany Murphy and I have a very wonderful special guest appearance of Dr. Ben Moralia. Thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Moralia. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. We are super excited. We have a good group of people on here. We have existing myofunctional therapists, hygienists wanting to be myofunctional therapists, some dentists on board. Um, we have a lot of questions, four pages worth of questions to get through. Um, let's start a little bit first by talking with Dr. Morali. I know one of the biggest things about registered dental hygienists going into myofunctional therapy is you want to make sure that there's a need for these services in offices. Where are you going to get your patients from? So Dr. Morali, if you want to share with everybody um, your take on myofunctional therapy. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so my story began 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, I got started with early intervention, I guess, phase one orthodontics, interceptive orthodontics. It has different names. But I was more interested in the growth and development, working with children earlier, and then grow the jaws, get the teeth second. So jaws first, teeth second. Well, I started out 20 years ago. I did not know what myofunctional therapy was. I did not know what an oral facial myofunctional therapist was. I had not met this community yet. So 20 years ago, I got started I'm treating these kids. Then one thing after another, then of course you start taking courses and you start meeting other people and you start building a collaborative team. And shortly after that, I started to realize, uh oh, there's an entire society out here that works on the cause. And so they work on the soft tissue dysfunction, the breathing, the musculature, the posture, all of this good stuff happening. And then you see what they're doing. And then I see, okay, what I'm doing is deficient. I need to include this. So we start finding them. So I'm in Westchester County, New York. Right away, we found several around the area. So within an hour, I have several. I was able to start referring. You're one of them, of course. So sure <laughs> enough, I start referring. So in, in our um, office, we recognize that over the 20 years, the swing has gone from not knowing something existed to knowing today that every single person would benefit from myofunctional therapy because anyone who has soft tissue dysfunction could benefit from correcting it. And so having a myofunctional therapist at any age is uh, an asset to the treatment and care in the collaborative mode. Uh, because I primarily work with the children between three and 12, of course, it's more heavily towards the pediatric population. I know that it's an essential part of the treatment. And in the collaborative care model, our office works with guidance appliances, expanders, a lot of things that are in the dental category used in and out of the mouth with removable and fixed varieties, but every single family is kind of taught about frenum and the orofacial myofunctional therapy route, and then a referral was made. And it doesn't mean everybody goes, but it does mean they're aware and they're educated. And now we have very high success rates with getting referrals to you and others in the community so they can help with those children. So having seen 20 years of work, I kind of know now the best results come from the collaborative model where if we're doing our part and then you're doing your part, we get the best results. And so when I say best results, we're talking about children who have issues with their musculature oftentimes are in that sleep disorder breathing category. So they have um, not just crowded teeth with a bad bite, a lot deeper than that. The foundation is underdeveloped. And then really behind that is this muscle dysfunction and weakness going on. So you have all of these things at the beginning of this that are the cause. So the category of treating the cause is totally different than treating the symptoms. So when we think about the traditional model where we just waited until 11 or 12 and used braces to straighten the teeth, that is a treat the symptom model. It does not address the cause at all. And really braces from 12 to 14 only really offers straight teeth temporarily. That's all you get from that because you have not addressed anything that has to do with the breathing or musculature. So braces don't improve your breathing or your musculature. So they make your teeth straight. And when you take the retainer away, they will go back because the teeth are going to land where the muscles kind of guide them. So leaving the musculature as a dysfunctional system, you're going to have this relapse at a very high rate, which is pretty much everybody that had braces and didn't wear their retainer, their teeth shifted back. Very rare. It's a unicorn to meet someone who had braces, lost their retainer, but their teeth stayed perfect. That's a unicorn. So all of this to say, the demand basically is every single child could benefit from myofunctional therapy unless you see that that child is growing into all of their adult teeth perfectly and doesn't require any type of orthodontic care. Because if your teeth are growing perfectly and you're going to land in a place where you belong looking like a textbook picture of teeth where they belong, you don't need us. 
But who, who, who meets that child? I don't know. Unicorn. <laughs> oh, unicorn. We're talking about a unicorn. So when you think about the need, it's any child that has teeth and a bite that aren't correct has underdeveloped jaws. And if you have teeth and a bite that aren't where they belong, you have underdeveloped jaws, you really have, it's the soft tissue dysfunction. The muscle dysfunction is there. So the idea is that you have a world of demand, but now the supply for this care is small considering that the entire population of all the children need this. So I was lucky to have them in my community to refer to. So I have been sending kids to my functional therapists like yourself for a very long time. Um, you have two pathways. You either find someone near you that you can refer to, which obviously would create demand because every kid can benefit from it, or you incorporate it into your practice. You train your hygienist or you hire one that knows how to do this. And if you have it in the office, now you have it, you know, right. So either way, it's either in your office or find someone in the community. Either way, the world has a shortage of myofunctional therapists. We need a whole lot more of them. And basically every child would benefit from that care. So that, that's my tiny take on what it means <laughs> to have, have myofunctional therapy involved with children who are growing and developing. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Moralia. A um, couple more questions we have for you. One of them is, um, this is coming from an office manager. <clears throat> they're introducing airway uh, into their office and they're struggling with getting parents to understand the importance of airway. I think the shift from, you know, seeing these families for years and years and years and maybe not really talking about it. And then all of a sudden now we have like all of this knowledge and it's like, well, why didn't you say anything before type of thing? Yes. And so that that does happen. Well, of course, we learn new things over time. And so we don't always have all the answers up front, but when we learn them, we want to share them. So a couple of pathways that can help a lot. The ADA has a wonderful brochure on screening children now. And so that, that brochure, I think, is available to all dental practices. And so we should get a copy of that in the office and then multiple of them so that we have this brochure to share and say, look, the ADA has a position on screening children who have sleep disorder breathing because it does have all kinds of relationships to their overall and general health. So you have this American Dental Association kind of branded brochure that says this is important to screen for. Now, another way to help the parents understand is to have sleep breathing questionnaires so that they could share more information about their kids outside of the office. Because what you might see inside is your diagnostic records, you're taking photos, you're taking measurements. So you have things to share, but it's also okay to ask the parents. And there are a lot of standardized sleep breathing questionnaires that you can ask parents and they can start to report things that are symptoms downstream like bedwetting or nightmares, or night sweats, or waking at night, or having troubles in school, behavioral issues. All of these things are kind of related. Restless sleep, grinding the teeth is a big one. If you're grinding your teeth, fair chance you probably have an airway issue. So there's a lot of things we can ask the parent with observation. Do you, is your child experiencing any of these troubles? When you're following those questionnaires, you start learning most of the children have at least one symptom. And a lot of them have multiple symptoms. So you start learning that, well, when the child has symptoms, then we have measurements and pictures and we can see that, you know, the baby teeth are too tight together or the permanent teeth are crowded. So we start talking about, well, this really isn't a tooth problem. It's a foundation problem, but it is the foundation that builds the ability to breathe well or not. So the maxilla and the mandible, as they go, so do the teeth. They either fit or they don't, mostly they don't, and the breathing. It's either easy or not. And sure enough, if we struggle to breathe well through our nose, we're going to end up unhealthy because there's a big difference between mouth breathing and nose breathing. So what the parent will recognize is the symptoms they're struggling with. Parents who have kids who are bedwetting and have ear infections and have behavioral issues and struggle in school and have nightmares and this list of things are struggles on a daily basis. You start sharing your diagnostics that you're measuring and seeing that the other child is at the jaw level, we're underdeveloped. And now we pair the two together and we say, well, if we're not breathing well, we're not sleeping well, we're bound to have symptoms and they are related. And you're basically educating. It's like anything else we do in dentistry, we share, we educate. And then of course you add it all up to what well, we have options. There are solutions and options that range from everything. But again, don't forget the myofunctional therapy because <laughs> that is a big option that will benefit a, a child of any age can be screened and then treated with myofunctional therapy is totally on the list of things to look for and do. It really is baby steps. You have to start putting these things together. And the more your team is working through their conversations with the parents, the more it starts to kind of light bulbs going off. And next thing you know, you're treating one, then another, then another, but then you, one child starts to improve. So the parent, well, what about our other child? What about our other? And these families with two, three, four kids, you're going to be treating them all. 
right. then the neighbor's kids are coming in and then the sister-in-law and the brother-in-law and the, you got to get in there. Look what they did for our kid. So it does kind of snowball rather quickly because the moment you start to help a child, that tends to get out of control quickly. And when I say out of control, it means everybody wants to be seen in your practice to have the help that you're offering. And our office grew substantially without ever doing any marketing or any type of, um, I, we never really did anything with the internet. Or, um, I'm only getting involved with that now because people tell me I have to do it. But the, <laughs> we never did. We never did any any advertising or marketing. It was just word of mouth. But as soon as you help a few kids, it kind of it, it'll happen. It'll take off. Just start to put the pieces together, and and you'll have a wonderful pathway. And I think, you know, what you said too, like the whole office needs to be educated on this, not just the clinical staff, but the clinical and the front staff. Yeah. There needs to be that shared message throughout because yeah. so, so often what, you know, gets talked about in the back and the operatory gets lost in translation when they're out to the front. And, you know, they might be asking the front desk, yeah. the coordinator, whatever. They Everybody needs to know exactly what's going on. Where are they getting referred? What are we starting with? Myofunctional therapy. We starting mm -hmm. them with, you know, um, a myofunctional appliance going yeah. straight to expansion. Why, why is the big question? Mm -hmm. And everybody has to understand the why in the dental office. Yeah. It's a team sport. It's a team sport and everybody should be involved in helping the child from the second they walk in the door. Like the child walks in the door, the entire team is observing that child. And then you get to a point where in it so far that it could be right at the reception. I mean, they'll, they'll know right away, like, oh, this child is so unhealthy and they're going to need our help. And we know right away. My husband like, sees it now. We can yeah. be out to dinner and he's like, Britt, anyway. over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You could see it everywhere. And, and so sure enough, and then you have to share things with parents and it's okay to mm -hmm. share Dr. Karen Bonick. Like um, that's been a big one for us. We mention and we, we teach parents, look, we want you to watch a few YouTube videos. Dr. Karen Bonick has wonderful interviews on YouTube. They're anywhere from two to 10 minutes long, but there's no one better than her to tell you her research. And she shares usually the end result of a parent watching a Dr. Karen Bonick interview on YouTube about kids sleeping and breathing is that she's she's talking about our child. Like she's she's That's exactly our child. What she's describing is our child. And what Dr. Karen Bonick does very nicely is she puts together that the way you breathe and sleep does affect your behavior the next day. But the way you breathe and sleep, also her research show does affect your cognitive ability and how well you can perform in school. So between behavior, behavior and school performance, no one better than Dr. Karen Bonick. We teach the parents, we tell them YouTube, Dr. Karen Bonick, sleep disorder, breathing kids, watch a couple of those and they'll call back a week later. We watched a few of those and that's, she's talking about our kid. We, we get it now. What do we do next? And then you're, you're off to the races, but your whole team on the same pages, that's the answer. You want to share and educate your whole office. Everybody should see this. Everybody should know what's happening. Everybody should know all the different things going on. In the end, you're really helping the kids. So for help the kids the best, the whole team, team sport. Definitely. All right. One more question for you, Dr. Morali. Then we're going to let you go because we know it's been a very long day. Um, this person, this is a registered dental hygienist, myofunctional therapist. They would like to know how we both handle pediatric referrals. For example, if a four-year-old is snoring, would you recommend OMT consult first or just send straight to ENT or sleep doctor for testing? Um, th that's pretty much the question, just that they're not sure. There's not, they don't feel there's a lot of info on, out there about how to handle that younger pediatric population. Right. So four years old, generally I do almost no sleep testing of the little ones. So technically I'm not treating their sleep diagnosis. So I don't treat OSA. I don't treat snoring. I treat malocclusion. I treat underdeveloped jaws. That's my lane. Mm -hmm. And so when you're dealing with symptom list growth and development, you're really making your diagnosis in the malocclusion category. Not to mention that sleep testing is uh, unreliable in children. At home testing isn't really considered diagnostic. It could be screened like screening. But even in a facility, a lot of people will tell you when a four-year-old goes with their mom or dad to a facility, it's a cold hospital room. They're connected to everything because it's like a PSG for a child. It's not a good night's sleep. You're not going to get a good night's sleep out of that. You don't have a good reading from that. If they did it for a week, you might get one reasonable night, but who could do this? So I've never really relied on a sleep study for a child for treatment because in the end, I have to treat their malocclusion and that's usually what resolves their issues treating them to what is normal size that they should be. Uh, as far as the ENT goes, a referral to the ENT is fine and getting a nasal scope can give you information. I almost never send a child to remove the tonsils and adenoids. I send them for a 
basically diagnostic uh, confirmation that I, I want to report back that tells me what is the adenoid size, what is the tonsil size, and they're in there with the nasal scope, so they have the little camera, they can look in, and they can tell you about the adenoids, and they'll give you a reasonable percentage of blocking. They can tell you because they're that close, it blocks 50% of the airway, 60, 75, they'll give you, an, and the same thing with the tonsils. Now we have this information back from the ENT that the tonsils and adenoids might be big, but in my world, I have the understanding that it really was the underdeveloped jaws that created the breathing issue. And when we switch from nose to mouth breathing, it gives you the larger tonsils and adenoids. So the tonsils and adenoids growth comes from the poor breathing. Now, of course, when they're getting bigger, they're making the breathing worse. But I don't see it as big tonsils and adenoids caused your breathing problem. And the research kind of follows that too. In other words, if you take out the tonsils and adenoids only, most of the kids are going to go back to their breathing problem. They have a short term that's improved, but they fade back to their OSA or their breathing problem because you haven't grown the anatomy. You just took out the contents. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a fan of just removing the tonsils and adenoids. It turns out there's very nice research that shows, and this is all from Stanford University with Dr. Christian Guimano, very well respected, did tons of research in sleeping and breathing. He understood that tonsil adenoidectomy was only successful if the child slipped to being a nose breather after they were removed. Very few kids can nose breathe after they're removed because they have underdeveloped anatomy and there's no room for their tongue and breathing. So if you remain a mouth breather after tonsils and adenoids are removed, sadly, within 36 months, they regrow and they granulate back in and you have the same problem you started with. So very low success rate for tonsil adenoidectomy, which is why it's not our first choice to treat a child. We really have to regain our growth of our jaws regain the muscle balance and strength. Obviously that's the myofunctional therapy component and release any type frenum that might be diagnosed and get that child back to nose breathing. Interestingly enough, if you can restore the nasal breathing, the tonsils and adenoids shrink. So it's been my experience that the, the better job that we do in the collaborative care category, grow the jaws and get the muscles and breathing back, work together, that child who can nose breathe, the tonsils that annoy shrink and their breathing problems and symptoms fade away. They don't need them removed. So I might see a few hundred kids a year, but only one or two need them out. So one or two kids a year do get them out. And again, tonsils are kissing, adenoids blocking 75% or more. That's the kid. So mm -hmm. when the when the ENT finds that, we say, oh yeah, that's really big. We probably can't get ahead of that, but it doesn't mean we take them out first. We still want to get that child heading in the right direction because we all know now, if we can get a nose breather first or close to that or getting when they're, when the tonsils or adenoids come out, they won't have to repeat it in a few years because mm -hmm. the children who had them out and come to see me years later and then we learn when they go back, it turns out they're bigger and they do have to remove them again. They So uh, I don't like that as a first choice. Um, mm -hmm. I would rather have the growth and the myofunctional therapy going then you have that as a backup in case you need it. You might get surprised and find that they shrink. Yeah, and there's been, that study came out, Dr. Yoon's study, was it 2021? I think it came out talking about palatal expansion and shrinking tonsils and adenoids. Yep, and the more appropriately the expansion is done and the more room the tongue has and better you are a nose breather, here they start to shrink. So the better your expansion technique is and the better your myofunctional therapy is, you get a better breather on your hands and then that is gonna help shrink those. So they don't need to be taken out and certainly taking them out isn't treating the cause. So removing tonsils and adenoids is really treating a symptom because the anatomy is still undersized and it doesn't make a better breather. So taking the contents out isn't the answer. We reserve it for a small percentage of kids who after having good expansion and myofunctional therapy. So I think the answer to the question was, I don't like to start with removing tonsils and adenoids because now I feel like, oh boy, I'm behind. I got to get this kid caught up. I don't see that as being the answer. So it's expansion, it's growth development techniques, plus myofunctional therapy, plus frenum revisions as needed. Those three things are how you get the case rolling. But the ENT can always do a nasal scope at the beginning. There's nothing wrong with learning what you're up against. If we're treating the patient together, we could have them revisit the ENT in six months or nine months or 12 months. Because you know we're gauging progress, we're gauging improvement. Oh, look at the improvement we're having. Look at the progress we're making. Let's go back to the ENT and check, do a follow-up. The nasal scope is very simple for them to do with a little of that anesthetic. It's not a big deal. So they could do a follow-up and then we can see which kid really needs that. And a year later, you learn very few. Absolutely. Dr. Morelli, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and chat with us. We're going to let you go, but we're wishing you the best holiday, safe travels, and enjoy your Christmas and happy new year. 
Thank you. Same to you. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Talk to you later. Thank Thanks. you. All right, guys. So we have a bunch of more questions to go over. One thing that I did want to mention is, you know, myofunctional therapy, because this was a question that we got. It is not just for kids. Um, Dr. Morelli, like he said, he treats a lot of kids. So every child that he's seeing is getting recommended myofunctional therapy. Please keep in mind that a lot of myofunctional therapists are working with kids and adults. I think the oldest adult that I've worked with to date right now was like 82 years old. Um, so wherever you're practicing, if you're in a general practice, restorative practice, orthodontic practice, oral facial pain practice, sleep practice, perio practice, cosmetic, full mouth reconstruction cases, there is a need for myofunctional therapy in every single dental treatment plan. I truly and honestly believe that. Um, think about all the patients out there that you're seeing clenching and grinding, right? What is that going to do to that beautiful restorative work or for full mouth reconstruction case if we're not getting to the base or the root cause of why they're clenching and grinding their teeth? Think about, you know, your patients that maybe have impeccable hygiene, but they're still getting recurrent decay. We need to address that mouth breathing habit. Think about your periodontal patients who routinely come in every three, four months for their perio maintenance. Their hygiene, again, impeccable. Their habits are good. What's going on? Why is their periodontal disease still active? There are reasons for that. And that myofunctional therapy has a role in each and every dental treatment plan. So for any newbie hygienists out there just getting into myofunctional therapy, please don't think that if you don't work in a pediatric practice that this is not for you. I promise that there is a need. Um, I wanted to just go over <clears throat> kind of like a, what is myofunctional therapy first? Because I do know that we have a lot of new people here um, that are just kind of getting involved with myofunctional therapy. So just for a little bit more clarification, um, myofunctional therapy is actually not new. It has been around, it dates back to the early 1900s. It wasn't exactly called myofunctional therapy back then, but think about how we classify our uh, malocclusion, right? Dr. Edward Engel, we have the Engel's uh, classification system. In 1907, he actually published an article called Malocclusions of the Teeth, where he talked about the influence that these negative habits, mouth breathing, open mouth posture, um, tongue, you know, breasting low in the roof of the mouth, what these negative oral habits could do and how they could negatively impact orthodontic results. And really talked about how we need to remediate these habits in order to be successful and uh, for retention and stability purposes. In the 1918s, Dr. Alfred Rogers wrote an article terming uh, each oral facial muscle living orthodontic appliances, which I love that because it just gives that much credit to what these muscles can do. Like Dr. Morales has said, you have to get to that root cause and that soft tissue dysfunction starts at a very young age. And if we're not correcting that, there's no amount of orthodontics, appliances, palatal expanders that's going to fix that. We have to correct that soft tissue dysfunction. There's that bi-directional relationship between structure and function. Um, in, I think it was like the 1950s, Dr. Walter Straub um, actually developed a myofunctional therapy program for a perverted swallow, what we know to be a tongue thrust swallowing pattern. Um, so again, it, it's been around. There are not a lot of myofunctional therapists. That's why I'm so happy that there's so many of you on the call tonight because there is such a need um, yes, a lot of us do offer virtual therapy, but there are some practices that are looking for more local high, uh, local myofunctional therapists, whether you're a hygienist and SLP, other allied healthcare professionals. So we're really trying to just help uh, spread that awareness. If you look up the technical definition of myofunctional therapy, and you might hear it called a few different things, oral facial myology, oral facial myofunctional therapy, we're going to call it myofunctional therapy for the sake of tonight's Q&A. But it is essentially the neuromuscular re-education or repatterning of those oral and facial muscles. So what we're really trying to do is remove unintentional pressures on those dental structures. So making sure that that tongue is sitting up in the roof of the mouth, the tip, the middle, and the back of the tongue, making sure that we have those counterbalancing pressures between the tongue, the lips, and the cheeks. So one doesn't win over the other, and we're not causing more narrowing of those dental arches. In terms of our goals as myofunctional therapists, when we're working with patients, um, you know, by the time a, a patient graduates their myofunctional therapy program, we do want to ensure that they've established dominant nasal breathing patterns. And this is all day and all night. Sometimes what you'll see is people might be nasal breathers during the day, but at night they're mouth breathers. We want to make sure that we're establishing that day and night. We want to attain a competent lip seal. So lips together posture all day and all night. 
We wanna have that palatal tongue grasp posture. So again, the tip, the middle, and the back of the tongue needs to be lightly suctioned in the roof of the mouth. Now, getting back to what Dr. Moralia was talking about, which is a, another Q&A for another night because we can spend an hour talking about tongue ties, but tongue ties can really interfere with somebody's ability to truly maintain a full lingual palatal suction. So I'm going to use my hands so hopefully you guys can see this, but tip of the tongue is going to be right up behind your upper incisor. So right on the incisive papilla is where you want the tip of the tongue to rest. Technical place is like that posterior third of the incisive papilla. The rest of the tongue should follow suit up there. Now, what you might find is some patients might say, oh yeah, I feel my tongue up in the roof of my mouth. The tip of their tongue might be up there where they're feeling it, maybe even in the correct place, maybe not pushing against their teeth. Perhaps maybe it's on that incisive papilla, but they're losing that mid to posterior palatal suction. And that's going to be really important for overall correct oral rest posture, for breathing. Think about our sleep patients. If somebody's tongue posture is more like this, or let's just say like literally low in the bottom of their mouth, and now they're going to sleep in a supine position, gravity will take over and that tongue can fall and block that airway even more. So we want to make sure that we're maintaining and have the ability to maintain these palatal tongue rest positions all day and all night. Uh, we're also working on optimizing um, our chewing patterns, having that bilateral alternating mastication. That's really important for proper bone loading. We want to optimize our swallowing patterns. Uh, we want to work on eliminating any kind of noxious oral habit, whether it's pacifier, thumb sucking, finger sucking, nail biting, cheek sucking, lip sucking, hair biting, shirts, anything that's going in the mouth that essentially should not be there. Because what is that going to do? It's going to displace that oral rest posture. That tongue's going to drop. Your lips are going to part. That jaw's going to slide forward. Um, for most of these habits. So those are our goals that we're working towards as myofunctional therapists. I'm going to stop going off on a tangent now, and we're going to get back to the questions that you guys all asked instead of just listening to me talk. Um, okay. So again, we have a lot of questions to go through. Hopefully we will get through all of these, but let's see what we have. So first question is, um, when to intervene with ortho and myo, how to get patients on board as adults with myo? Okay, so when to intervene with ortho and myo. The earliest, the better, for sure. But do know that it is never too late. Again, I like I mentioned, we work with, I have an 82-year-old who's doing myofunctional therapy right now. Um, as far as expansion goes, we also can work on that in adults. There are surgical and non-surgical techniques. That's not the basis of this Q&A, so we're not going to deep dive into that. That would be more a Dr. Moralia question. Um, but the earlier, the better. What I was, again, as hygienists, we don't learn this stuff in school. I remember when I first heard about myofunctional therapy, I was like, did I skip class this day? Like, I have no idea what this is. And I reached out to my best friend that I uh, met in hygiene school. And she's like, no, we definitely never learned about that. So don't feel bad. It's, it's not taught often. There is a hygiene program in Michigan, I believe it is, Kalamazoo, who actually has myofunctional therapy in their hygiene curriculum, but we're not there yet. So- you're here now, you're learning about it now, but it's going to be like light bulbs going off left and right for you guys. Um, you know what? So what I was getting at is when I learned that 60% of our craniofacial development is already completed by about age four, that blew my mind because I think back to when I was practicing clinical hygiene, which I haven't done for a little bit now. When are we making orthodontic referrals? I mean, hopefully by age seven, but sometimes that's even too late. Um, you know, I remember depending which practice I was in, everybody kind of has their different protocols. Some of these patients aren't getting referred to all their baby teeth are, are, are exfoliated and that's way too late. Um, so again, knowing now what I know, we want to refer as soon as there is a sign that something is awry. So baby teeth that don't have that proper spacing. If we cannot essentially take a nickel and stick it up between each tooth, Something's going on there and we want to better track that craniofacial development. We want to get that patient in myofunctional therapy. We want to get them to somebody like Dr. Moralia and for uh, hygienists out there that want to have their dentist more involved in airway. We're going to talk about courses that Dr. Moralia offers as well at the end to learn more of his expansive techniques. If you want to start even earlier in that more two, three, four age range, we have Dr. Kevin Boyd um, on faculty who treats that age. Um, so the earlier, the better. The second part to that question, how to get patients 
on board as adults with Mayo? Well, I, again, this is going to depend really on what they're going through, but I think if you're an adult that's going through orthodontics right now, why are you investing $7,000, however much money it is for orthodontics, if you're not fixing that soft tissue dysfunction? When I go and do lunch and learns in orthodontist office, and they're usually like, you know, what kind of patients do you want us to send to you? And my answer is literally every single patient that is in an orthodontic office needs to be seen by a myofunctional therapist. Why did their jaws develop the way they did? Why are they underdeveloped to begin with? Why are they deficient from that soft tissue dysfunction? So I think, you know, when you, when you're talking to adults and letting them know you're investing all of this money, but we want to make sure for stability and retention purposes that you get to see a myofunctional therapist. If you're an adult that has obstructive sleep apnea, there is research out there that supports that oral pharyngeal exercises. This was a study in 2015 by Dr. Camacho it was a meta-analysis that shows that oral pharyngeal exercises can reduce the AHI, the apnea hypopnea index, which is how sleep apnea gets diagnosed more so for insurance purposes, but that's another story too. Um, it can reduce the AHI by 50% in adults and 62% in children. So if you're in a practice where you're making uh, mandibular advancement appliances for sleep apnea patients with mild to moderate OSA or snores, there's a place for myofunctional therapy there. It can increase the efficacy of those appliances. It can increase the ease and comfort of wearing those appliances. And the same thing for our patients on CPAP. It could increase the efficacy and make it more comfortable for that patient to actually be compliant with that CPAP. We know oftentimes people aren't compliant with those CPAPs, which is again, why we want to get somebody more to somebody like Dr. Moralia and a myofunctional therapist. That was a long-winded question, guys, for just question number one, but let me cross that off so I don't go back to it. Um, okay, let's see. When does OMT fit into Dr. Moralia's treatment plan? So um, I obviously am not Dr. Moralia, but uh, if he was on here, I think what he would say is that when, when a patient is in a fixed rapid palatal expander, you can do myofunctional therapy. However, there's a lot going on up there and we're not going to be able to get proper tongue positioning. So in my world, the perfect time to see a myofunctional therapy patient would be post-expansion once we have that actual space for the tongue to fit up there. The way I explain it to parents and to patients is I can be the best myofunctional therapist in America, but if there's literally not enough real estate in the roof of your mouth for your tongue to live, it is going to be very difficult to get it to be there. With that being said, there are some providers that want us myofunctional therapists working with these patients before they start that expansion process. So there is a time and a place before and after. In my practice, um, we don't typically work with um, patients while they're in a palate expander for that reason though. Um, all right, let's see what's next. Uh, what is the earliest? What is the earliest we should start intervention? We kind of already talked about that. What is the youngest age to start myofunctional exercises? So patients definitely have to be, um, they have to be able to follow direction, right? So they have to cognitively be able to understand what it is you're asking them to do. In a full myofunctional therapy program, I'm usually starting that at about age five. Um, although there have been some, I mean, you know, everybody's maturity level is a little bit different. There have been some four-year-olds I've been able to put through a full myofunctional therapy program, but usually five, six is when we're starting that. We do do some mini myo with three, four-year-olds, but again, it depends. If there is a need for them to see a feeding therapist, then we're not going to work with them. We're referring them out to see a feeding therapist or an occupational therapist um, that does feeding therapy. Um, okay. What is the best way to explain how tongue ties affect airway in adult? Should tongue ties be released as an adult? So I think that the best way to explain how tongue tie can affect airway in, a, in an adult is kind of what we were talking about before. If you cannot suction your tongue to the roof of your mouth because you have a tongue tie, it has nowhere to go when you're sleeping, but to fall and block the airway. Okay. Also, if you don't have, if you have more low tongue posture, that is going to be associated with more mouth breathing habits. 
that's going to be associated with more chronic nasal congestion because we're having that mouth open and slumped open the whole time. There's going to be um, a difference in the exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide, which is going to signal things to your brain to produce more congestion. Um, I'm getting a little deep dive here for that, but um, yeah, I mean, I think should, should tongue ties be released in an adult? Yes, I absolutely think so. You want to make sure that there's room in there palate uh, for that tongue to live. We don't want to be making any kind of sleep apnea worse. So that's where that collaborative team is really important. And you really should be deciding with, um, you know, the airway dentist, the release provider and the myofunctional therapist, when is the best time to be released? You absolutely a thousand percent need to do myofunctional therapy, especially as an adult, but everybody prior to that release, you do not just want to see that patient post-release. What we're doing prior is we're already starting to educate these muscles. We're working on building rapport. We're working on reducing any compensations that might be going on. What I mean by compensations is when you're watching patients perform certain excursions, let's say that they're, I don't know, even holding their lingual palatal suction. And all of a sudden you see all these neck muscles engage. That's compensation. If you're asking somebody to move their tongue side to side, and you see that jaw moving, those are compensations. These are all things that we want to work on prior to that patient having that tongue tie release. Um, okay, next question. Where is best to train? Certification isn't regulated. How to make money when insurance doesn't apply? So, excuse me, guys, my dog wants to come up here. Um, where's the best place to get to train? There are multiple um, institutes out there that have introductory courses. At the end of tonight's webinar, we're going to talk about our introductory course. So our School of Mayo um, Airway Health Solutions introductory course. Um, it is a 28-hour introductory course, which most of them are. Um, certification is not regulated. That is correct. So how there is no governing body. So how we have our hygiene license, there is no governing body like that for myofunctional therapy. You do not actually have to have a certification to practice myofunctional therapy. You have to have a healthcare license. You have to be a, a dentist, a hygienist, an SLP, PT, OT, et cetera. You have to have taken a 28 introductory, 28 hour introductory course. And then you are able to begin practicing myofunctional therapy. I took my first introductory course in 2016 and I did not become certified um, until I think it was 2018, 2018 or 2019. I, I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but I did still see patients in those two years. So you do, do not need to be certified. I just want you guys to know that and understand that. Um, how to make money when insurance doesn't apply. So as a hygienist, we can't really bill for insurance. We talk about this in our course. We talk about um, how you can create super bills, um, have give that documentation to patients so they can send to their insurance so that if they get reimbursement, insurance will reimburse them. I can tell you more often than not, it is not going to get covered uh, as a hygienist doing myofunctional therapy. And how do we then get patients to accept this? Well, I think, how do we get patients to accept dental treatment that isn't covered by their insurance, right? We don't want insurance to dictate uh, the kind of care and the quality of care that we're able to provide first and foremost. Um, yes, there are families financially burdened, so that I understand. Um, I think that's going to depend on your practice. You know, you could have different payment plans. You could have monthly payment plans. Um, you know, we I accept health savings accounts, which is very helpful to families that have that through their employer. Um, I think that once you educate the family enough, that's the biggest part. And I think that's why that hygienist makes such great myofunctional therapists is that that's what we do all day long, right? Is we educate. When you can get a family or an adult to understand how their myofunctional disorder is impacting their everyday life, the way they breathe, the way they sleep, the energy they have, how present they are in their life. If they're having, you know, chronic neck and shoulder tension from a tongue tie, whatever it, it is, you need to speak to that patient's pain point because of that is what's going to be important for them. And we all know that we spend money on things that are important to us and having those conversations and networking and things like that are also things that we will cover in our introductory course. Um, all right, that was kind of the same question. Is there an online course that could certify a dental hygienist to become a myofunctional therapist without a hands 
without hands-on for those who don't live in the country. Yeah. So again, there's other myofunctional therapy courses out there besides ours. Obviously I am going to talk about ours. Um, I'm a little biased. I think that ours is a very good, well-rounded, comprehensive course. Um, I worked very, very hard on developing it, but, um, what I would say is we offer, so we have two options. There's a completely self-paced on demand option that you totally can do. My learning style, I would recommend our eight week course. It is still on demand. You don't have to go anywhere. You can answer in your pajamas. It is a very carefree environment when we're when we're learning together. But what happens in our eight week course is every Wednesday, a lecture will get released. That Monday, we have a Q&A based on that lecture or any other questions that you guys have. And I really find that it's the Q&A that helps really seal uh, your understanding much deeper, at least in my opinion. I love our Q&A sessions. I think that it just kind of takes everything to the next level personally. Um, however, if that is not your learning style and you're more like, I want to do this on my own, we will have an on-demand option. There just will not be any Q&As that are offered. You still will get um, access to our School of Mayo a School of Mayo alumni Facebook group, which is private for our alumni, where I will be hosting quarterly Q and A's. So you will get access to me there. You're also always welcome to reach out to me. But I think when we have a group of students learning together and we have an hour, we get to just answer questions. People are asking things maybe you didn't even think to ask, or they're asking something maybe you were nervous to ask, or we're just, again, we're deep diving into these topics. Um, okay, next question. I would like to know where I should be referring children with a seemingly small restricted airway or mouth breathing issues. I see these issues so frequently and their pediatricians are not diagnosing sleep studies or really anything. What do I do? And this is from an RDH. So, okay. So restricted airway, I have a few referrals that I would make. So what Dr. Moralia said, I often am referring to an ENT 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, unless they've already seen, were seen by an ENT because my job will not be successful if somebody cannot breathe through their nose. So that is absolutely imperative. I like to have that baseline. I want the parent to be able to go there and hear from the ENT that that child's airway is 75% obstructed, 80% obstructed. There's something to be said about that number that helps parents understand, okay, this is an issue that needs to be taken care of now. Now, maybe that answer isn't taking out the tonsils and adenoids like Dr. Moralia says. Maybe it's working with a provider like Dr. Moralia to gain that expansion and gain that space um, so that you know we can see some shrinkage because one of the things that I always whip out in my appointments is our skull, right? The base, um, I'm sorry, the floor of our nose is the same as our upper jaw. It's the same bone. And I even ask this question to my five-year-old patients. It's color-coded, right? The bones on this skull. And I'll say to them, Okay, this bone right here, this is your upper jaw. Can you tell me what else this upper jaw bone makes up? And they'll look and they'll tell me the nose. And I'll say, yes, you're right. The roof of your mouth is also the floor of your nose. It's also the lateral chambers of your nasal cavity. So if our upper jaw is narrow, this area is gonna be reduced as well. So if we can expand that area, expand that nasal volume, these patients are gonna be able to breathe better. They're gonna be able to sleep better and they're gonna be able to thrive. Um, so an ENT, just to see exactly what is going on to get confirmation on that, a myofunctional therapist, cause we absolutely need that breathing reeducation. It is one of my pet peeves when ENTs take out tonsils and adenoids and don't refer to a myofunctional therapist for breathing reeducation. You can remove that obstruction, but not every patient is going to return to being a nasal breather because let's say they're eight years old when they get their tonsils and adenoids out probably for eight years, they were breathing through their mouth. It's different muscles that are being used. When you're a mouth breather, most of that movement's coming from that chest, from that thoracic cavity. We need to be diaphragmatic nasal breathers. So even teaching children how to breathe correctly, not only lips closed and using their nose, but where's that primary movement coming from is not something that is just going to click. Same thing with tongue ties. You can release a tongue tie and give a tongue all of this mobility, but the tongue doesn't just know what to do. It's not just gonna magically go to the roof of the mouth. It's not just magically gonna know how to swallow correctly. That is where that neuromuscular reeducation by a myofunctional therapist is imperative. Um, okay, let's see. 
somebody wants to know how I got into this field. How did I become a myofunctional therapist? Uh, they love hearing about myofunctional therapy and would love to be a myofunctional therapist at some point in their career. Well, I also hope that you become a myofunctional therapist um, and any questions you have after this, feel free to reach out to me. How I got into this field, I heard about myofunctional therapy in one of my RDH magazines. It was an article written by Joy Moeller, who is a fantastic, incredible trailblazer in myofunctional therapy. She's been doing this for like, I think 50 years, maybe more. Um, I read about it and I, again, I, I didn't know what it was, but I just, I was so fascinated by it. You know, we're all looking for ways that we can improve our standard of care, improve our patient's quality of life. And I just felt like this was a missing piece to something that would explain why things that I would see clinically just didn't make sense and nobody had an answer for. One of them, I think about this patient all the time, I can't remember his name right now, but so-and-so would call and he'd say how he broke his crown. And it'd be like an inside joke in our office. Like, oh my gosh, here he is chewing on rocks again. What's he doing? Why, how is he breaking these crowns? Never was his airway checked. Never did we ask about how he was sleeping. Never did he get a CBCT. Maybe he had a tongue tie. I, I don't even know. These weren't things that I was trained with at that point. But I always thought like, there has to be something going on. Like this doesn't sound, this isn't right. Patients shouldn't be, be breaking, fracturing crown after crown after crown. Why is that patient clenching and grinding their teeth? The amount of night guards, NTIs that I, rec that I recommended as a dental hygienist before I became a myofunctional therapist, if I could go back to every single one of those patients and contact them, I would truly love to recommend a sleep study. I say this all the time when I go to general practices or really any dental practice, we should not be, re re be recommending night guards to patients without first ruling out airway. Why is that patient clenching and grinding their teeth? Yes, stress plays a role in it, but it is not the end all be all. That patient could be struggling to breathe at night. And there's research out there that now supports this. If we think about the muscles that are involved when we clench our teeth, those muscles are also involved in helping to open our jaw and bring our lower jaw forward. Then we have to think, well, what do we do when we make our mandibular advancement appliances to help people breathe and sleep better at night? We make these appliances so that that lower jaw protrudes. So these patients all night long are clenching and grinding their teeth in attempts to help open their airway. It's your body's protective mechanism. Our body is a beautiful thing and will do whatever it needs to do to keep us alive. And that's why people mouth breathe. People mouth breathe because they can't breathe through their nose. What's the alternative? If you can't breathe through your nose, you have to breathe through your mouth. Otherwise, we're not looking so hot. So even think about kids that um, parents come in and they talk about what messy eaters they are and how they chew with their mouth open. Like, what do I have to do? I don't know how to get him to chew with his mouth closed. Well, did you ever think that that's how he breathes? He can't keep his lips closed and, and chew because he wouldn't be able to breathe. The only option is for him to chew with his mouth open. Um, okay, next question. How do you manage a narrow palate if the patient is not going to have expansion? So this is definitely uh, a time where you then have to have that conversation with a patient. I am very upfront with my patients that myofunctional therapy, as important as it is, it is extremely important, right? It is very foundational. But especially when we're talking, um, I don't know if this was adults specifically, Myofunctional therapy is only going to take you so far. Okay. I show my families this slide that has three triangles. One is structure. So that's making sure that there is enough room for the tongue to live. One's function, making sure that our muscles are acting as they should. And the other is limitations. And we have to know our limitations. We can't squish a tongue in a mouth that just has no room for it. And there was a book written by Dr. Felix Liao called, um, I always mess up the numbers backwards. Six foot tiger, three foot cage. A six foot tiger is never going to fit in a three foot cage. So if somebody has an extremely narrow palate, I'm going to be limited as a myofunctional therapist with what I could do. Now, I'm not necessarily going to deny this patient treatment, but I need them to understand, and I have this in, written in my contracts, that this is something that will cause us to not reach optimal, uh, optimal um, results. Same thing with a tongue tie. If a patient doesn't want to have a tongue tie released, you might not be able to get that whole tongue to rest up in the roof of the mouth. So you're going to receive suboptimal results. 
If you're somebody that has chronic allergies and you're not addressing those allergies, you're not going to get far in your myofunctional therapy program. So again, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't treat this patient, but I would explain to them the importance of it and how it's bi-directional and everything works together. Now, yes, you can get some expansion from myofunctional therapy, but a lot of these patients are needing much, much more than they're ever going to get from just doing myofunctional therapy. Now, there are some body workers out there. There's amazing manual therapists out there that have fabulous techniques that they can help manually try to provide a little bit more space up there. But at the end of the day, it's really important that we're working hand in hand with these orthodontists and airway dentists to provide that ample room, regardless of the patient's age. <clears throat> How do you recognize oral facial dysfunctions that need referral? Um, so again, this is something that we're going to go over in our course. I also want to develop a course just for hygienists that want to maybe have a little bit more knowledge, but don't maybe want to become a myofunctional therapist, which again is totally fine. But I think things that you can start doing and implementing tomorrow, I think watching your patient, observing your patient, how do they look? Is their mouth open? Are they breathing through their mouth? Do you see their tongue? When you're um, sitting them in the chair, take a Malin potty score. If anybody doesn't know what the Malin potty grade is or the Malin potty scoring is, it was actually developed by a group of anesthesiologists to predict the ease of intubation for their patients. However, in the sleep airway dentistry world, we use it as a way and, and sleep physicians as well to um, assess the likelihood that that patient's airway can obstruct. So what you're doing is you're sitting them in a neutral position. You're asking them to open. They're extending their tongue. You're shining your light back there and you're looking. What structures can you see? You want to be able to see everything. So we want to see all the way down to the very apex of that uvula. We want to be able to see the tonsils if the tonsils are still there. What you'll see, that would be a grade one. That's what we want to see. We want to see everything back there. As that uvula, I kind of use the uvula as my like um, point that I'm looking at, but as that uvula becomes more and more obstructed, to the point where now you see no soft palate at all, you only see the hard palate, that would be a grade four. A grade three or a four absolutely needs to be assessed further in my opinion. Um, you can look at, grab a cotton roll. Cotton rolls are generally 37 millimeters. Just make sure you measure it. It might vary a little bit, manufacturer to manufacturer. Factor, take that cotton roll, put it up between three and 14. If we have in our, our uh, first, molars. If it's a child, you can do from A to J, but put that cotton roll up there and see exactly, does it fit? That cotton roll is 37 millimeters. We as adults want to be somewhere between, I think for females, about 38 to 42 millimeters for males between 40 to 44 millimeters. If you're stuffing that 37 millimeter cotton roll between three and 14, then you know, you have a problem there. When you're working with kids, those cotton rolls probably are going to be a little bit too big in our little, little ones. Um, I can tell you by age five, we want to be at 30 millimeters. By age eight, we want to have a 35 millimeter transverse width. Um, I know me, I'm not even at 35 millimeters and I have perfect occlusion class one, never had braces, but I'm narrow. The way that I tell and the way that you can also tell on your patients is if you ask them to suction their tongue to the roof of their mouth. See how my tongue splays over my occlusal surfaces? That should not happen. Your tongue should fit in the roof of your mouth like a car fits in a garage. That's not the case for me, right? I would totally be skimming the sides of my car, maybe taking off my mirrors. Um, I would really benefit from expansion. So that's a good way to tell if somebody's tongue actually fits in the roof of their mouth. Um, let's see, let's go on to another question because we are almost out of time. Oh, guys, yeah, we're going to answer one more question. Then we have a few more things to go over. Um, let's see. Um, we already talked about that. I have a 13-year-old patient in Mayo who has an excessive yawning habit. It has worsened over our sessions together. At times, it actually interferes with our exercises or practice. Any advice? So, well, first, I'd want to make sure that um, 
they don't have some kind of sleep disorder going on. Like I would ask about sleep and things like that first and make sure that there isn't something that we're missing there. Um, but there can be yawning when you're stimulating the vagus nerve, which we do with our myofunctional therapy exercises. So it could also be in relation to that. Uh, let's see. There's a couple questions in here too, guys. I'm sorry. We didn't get through all of these. Um, so Dr. Karen Bonick is who Dr. Morale was referring to. You can YouTube Dr. Karen Bonick, um, and watch those videos. What is the first step to take for an RDH to get more info on an independent career in myofunctional therapy? Would you recommend a certain course? Andrea, we're going to go over that in a second. Um, but I would say, you know, if you want, you can do myofunctional therapy either way. You can do it in your existing dental practice. You can open your own private practice. It's really going to be which way you want to go. Um, you know, talking about being a business owner and entrepreneur is a whole other discussion. And again, probably another hour that we could talk together. Um, but if you have any questions specifically about having like an independent private practice, definitely reach out to me. Um, all right, let's see. Did I miss the part where you explain what myofunctional therapy actually is and why it's recommended? Um, no, I don't think you did. Cause that was right. We, we talked about that in the beginning. Okay. We are going to, I'm going to share my screen for a second, guys, to go over because we have a raffle. We have something to give away to you guys. So let me share my screen first, and then we'll have Gerald pull our raffle ticket. You do have to still be online and present in order to be the winner. All right. Okay, so our Airway Health Solutions School of Mayo introductory course, we are launching on uh, February 7th will be our next course date. The way that is going to work, again, every Wednesday, so February 7th is a Wednesday, every Wednesday there will be, will be a lecture that is released. You are watching that lecture in your own time so that you can take notes, pause, rewind, listen to it multiple times if you want. Then on that following Monday from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we meet live for a virtual Q&A. There are 28 hours of um, AGDCE credits that you get from taking this course. You do have to be present for the live Q&As in order to receive that week CE, just so that you know. Um, also, in addition to this course, when you register, you are going to have access to eight pre-learn modules. We're going to go over what those are in a jiffy. Um, we are offering, yay, because it's Christmas. I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday. We're offering $500 off this course from now to the end of the year. So hopefully you guys are going to treat yourself to a beautiful Christmas present. You definitely deserve it. Um, our course syllabus. So like I said, those pre-learn modules that will get released to you, you have access to them as soon as you register. We are going over history of myofunctional therapy and an overview of oral facial myofunctional disorders, reviewing head and neck anatomy, dental sleep concepts for the myofunctional therapist, networking with confidence. It's important if you're going to be a myofunctional therapist that you have that collaborative team that you're working with, um, you know, a release provider, an ENT, an allergist, an expansion provider, um, body workers, speech language patho uh, pathologist, et cetera. Marketing strategies and practice design. Uh, we have two special guest lectures, which are super exciting by Dr. Moralia, who you all met tonight, and Dr. Kevin Boyd. And then there is a bonus pre-learn module for non-dental professionals that want to take this course, uh, introductory dental knowledge, tooth numbering systems, mal uh, you know, different occlusions, things like that, bites, common things that you might see. And then also common appliances that are used as a myofunctional therapist, especially if you're working in a private-based um, private based practice, you're going to be working with providers that use all different kinds of oral appliances, all different kinds of myofunctional guidance appliances, expanders. So having a little bit of knowledge on what's what is important. As far as our eight weeks go together, week one, we are learning how to do a patient intake, uncovering the connection between OMDs and overall health. Week two, you will learn how to perform a comprehensive evaluation. Week three, we're learning about tethered oral tissues across the lifespan. Week four, we dive into those myofunctional therapy exercises. Week five is our treatment planning protocol. Knowing how to take a patient from start to finish is very important, how to put everything together. We don't just want to throw exercises at patients just to throw them. There should be knowledge as to why you're giving a certain exercise to a patient. Week seven, or oh, I skipped week six. Week six, business planning and practice management. 
Week seven, treatment troubleshooting, how to handle those tough cases. Like Dr. Morales said, there's not a lot of unicorns walking around out there. So having different tools in your toolbox um, is very important. Week eight is my absolute favorite part of this course. You will leave the course already have starting your first patient. This patient can be yourself. It could be a loved one. It could be a patient. Um, and everybody will have about 15 minutes to present their own case study. It's a super great learning experience, guys. It is literally the best part. Everybody always says how, how much knowledge that they gain from this and how, you know, different people might pick out different things. So I hope that that makes you excited and doesn't make you nervous. Um, it's exciting to see everything you learn come together at the end and really show how confident you are and how ready you are to go off on your own and start your myofunctional therapy journey. Then uh, we have individual private coaching calls as a bonus. For my existing myofunctional therapists out there, if you are interested in shadowing me, this can be in person. I would love for you to come to Connecticut and spend a whole day with me and my patients. If that's not feasible, I'm also offering this virtually. We see a lot of patients virtual um, as well, but we'll also just set you up and turn the computer and let you see what's going on in the office. Spend a whole day with me. Um, you know, we'll make sure that we're scheduling all different kinds of patients throughout different uh, phases of their treatment. For my dentists out there or your hygienists that are wanting your dentist to become more involved in airway, Dr. Ben Moralia has his pediatric mini uh, residencies. Dates for those are January 19th. March 1st, April 12th, and June 7th, there is on-demand access. Then our adult mini-residency hosted by Dr. Ben Moralia, Learn His Techniques for Adults. We have those on February 9th and April 19th, also with on-demand access. Our AHS two-day advanced mini-residency with Dr. Moralia, Learn Dr. Morales' fixed expansion um, and expansive ortho for teens. This is a 13-hour CE course um, with on-demand access available as well. Yay, time for Airway Palooza. So we're going to actually draw a winner for tonight. But join the celebration of the year. Join us in New Orleans at the Ritz-Carlton. Um, it's going to be an event like no other. It is two days of just tremendous learning. Look at this incredible speaker lineup. It is so much fun. Lauren does just an absolutely fantastic job putting uh, this event together. Um, so I'm super excited to be there and hopefully meet most of you. Hopefully you can come. There is uh, virtual tickets also available. Um, and I think this is when Gerald is going to do our raffle, but you can use the code AP150 to get $150 off to buy your Airway Palooza ticket. Uh, there's a live doctor ticket. Um, and a live OMT or team member ticket. Or if you want to do the payment plan, uh, you can do $966.33 monthly for three months. Um, and then $533 a month for three months if you're a myofunctional therapist. And this offer is going to be good through the end of the year. Also join Lauren for another conversation series. Um, she's going to have a special guest, Dr. Susan Maples, talking about pediatric airway health, breathe well, little one. This will be one you don't wanna miss. Dr. Susan Maples is incredible. She wrote an amazing book called, um, How to, uh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Brave. I I'm forgetting the name right now. I'm so sorry, Dr. Maples, but it's an incredible book. Um, I recommend it to all my families. Uh, she'll definitely be talking about it that night. So scan that QR code, register. Um, and remember that we uh, Lauren does have on the Airway Health Solutions platform all of the past conversation series. Um, so feel free to access those as well. I appreciate you guys coming and hanging out with me tonight. It's been a blast. And Gerald, if you want to hop on and we can do our raffle winner for tonight. How exciting. And this is for a free virtual ticket to Airway Palooza. Christine Yuan. All right, let's see. Is she still on, Gerald? I 
I don't know how to tell. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Christine, Christine, Christine. <gasps> Christine is still on. Yay, Christine. I'm super excited for you. Um, I think, Gerald, you'll be in contact with Christine for that. Um, everybody, I hope you had a wonderful night. I hope you enjoyed this q and I'd love to do it again soon. If you have any other questions, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can find me on Instagram. My handle is CT Oral Facial Myology. Find me on Facebook. You can email me, Brittany at myctom.com. I'd be happy to help answer any questions. If you're not already part of our The Myo Hygienist Facebook group, uh, please feel free to join that as well. Have a good night, everybody.